Well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for inviting me to come talk with you today. And uh, I'm excited to share my work with you. So in Cheryl's email to me, she said she'd talk for about an hour and show lots of pictures. So get ready. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> uh, I think by the time I, I even took some out, but I think I have about 10 different bodies of work that I'm going to go through and, and just kind of talk about um, how I started making pictures. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning, talk about how I started making photographs, uh, work through some of my progress in uh, graduate school and moving across the country and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And we're going to end up with I ended earlier than now, uh, you know, I have right now four or five projects that I'm working on, but I ended on just one of them where I'm, I'm making some tin type images and we'll get into that and talk about those. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share my screen and turn off my camera just to save some bandwidth and make sure that um, I don't freeze too much. You'll get to see a lovely painting of me by uh, former colleague Gary Nimkoski. Um, but uh, during the talk, I love it when people ask me questions while we're going through. I always forget my questions by the end of the talks, uh, and I love it when people invite me to ask questions. So if that's okay with y'all, uh, Cheryl and everybody, sure. I love it. And I don't know if I'll be able to see you or the chat uh, very well. So if, if anybody knows, Cheryl, if you notice questions or if anybody has them, just feel free to interrupt and, and just let me know what questions you might have. Um, but I'm going to share this now. Well, first I'll turn off my video and uh, share this screen. And <laughs> I always uh, tell people that I like to start with this picture because I think it's funny. I think this is a funny picture and I like to start with it because I, I think at heart uh, I'm kind of, I'm pretty lighthearted, um, but a lot of my early work, especially right here at the beginning is a little bit heavier. So I like to set a light mood and then switch it up on you and make you depressed right away. Uh, that's just how I like to do things. So um, thanks so much again for having me here. So when I was, when I was younger, uh, when I was in high school, I thought to myself, what do I want to do with my life? And they have all those aptitude tests and I took them. Uh, and it turned out that I should be a dentist or a scientist or a surgeon or something like that. That's what it led me towards. Uh, and so CSI uh, had come out at that point, uh, Crime Scene Investigation. It was one of the earlier crime dramas. Not this one. I don't like that guy from CSI Miami. I like Gil Grissom from, uh, from Las Vegas. So I got really interested in, um, in science and in working in a laboratory. And I went to Indiana University uh, and studied um, criminal justice and chemistry in hopes of being a forensic scientist. And that did not work out. Uh, I bounced around a lot uh, at, at Indiana University, didn't love the kind of statistics and sociology classes and things that I was taking along with, with uh, chemistry. And I really looked forward to working in the lab and didn't really get much experience with that. And I came back home and uh, went to a community college for a couple of years and studied everything they had. I majored in computer science and pre-nursing and general education studies, uh, which seems like a poor choice of major, but I did that for a little while. And I ended up accidentally in a microbiology class and I fell in love with it. I loved it so much. Uh, so much so that after my first semester, they invited me to be the lab manager. Uh, and this is a slide that it shows um, E. coli, you know, just regular old E. coli growing on uh, erythromycin blood agar or agar. Um, and it turns this really beautiful metallic, doesn't really have anything to do with the story. I just think this is a pretty picture. Uh, but I, I really fell in love with microbiology. And then uh, for Christmas that year, my mom bought me a little point and shoot camera and ruined everything. I immediately fell in love with how I could use that camera to document the world around me. Um, and just, I was kind of like a man possessed. I started photographing everything I could find. And I asked a friend if uh, Northern Kentucky University offered photo classes, and she said yes. And so I had gone to school for about four years, accomplished almost nothing, uh, and I started over. Basically, I went for four more years at Northern Kentucky University and, and studied photography. And this first series of images that I'm going to share with you is called Quietus. And during the time that I was kind of started working in, in art at, the, at this university at Northern Kentucky, my grandfather, uh, his health started to decline. And I know that, you know, everybody is, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are close with their family. So that's not really a different story. But 
my grandfather um, was a sign painter. He was a really religious man. He went to a Church of Christ, kind of an evangelical Church of Christ, and took us with him every single Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We went to church three times a week. There were youth groups and gatherings, and uh, we went out on soul-winning expeditions and things like that. Um, and I was so involved that at a certain point I was planning to go to seminary and, and be a, a, a preacher, be a, like a, a big tent revival kind of evangelical preacher. And then I started to have a lot of questions about, um, about the church, about how they taught, about what they believed, and, and some disagreement with some of the fundamental beliefs that they held. And um, so that, that was kind of happening, me questioning this religious upbringing that I had. Uh, at the same time, my grandfather's health was declining, and it was kind of at the same time that I was becoming an adult, you know, that I was growing up and, and kind of not thinking of him any longer as this icon in the family or a figurehead and this figure removed, but kind of thinking about him as a man and getting to know him more as a human being and thinking about his sign painting and his artistic practice. And then also I had this love of, of science and biology that had always been part of me, but uh, was sort of burgeoning as I started to understand my relationship to microbiology and uh, laboratory work and that kind of thing. And so this series of work that I started to create, I wanted to look at life and the end of life from these three different viewpoints. So there are these three kinds of photographs that I, I weaved together. So there were these images of birds that I took to be a more spiritual um, relationship with my grandfather. There were these images of specimens, of biological specimens that I photographed that I, I meant to be a link to kind of the, just the physical death of a body and what happens when things die. And then there were these third uh, images that were photographs that I made the night that he died. Uh, so I got a call from my mom who was in this photograph and she said, hey, you need to come to the nursing home. We think he's going to pass away tonight. And I ran out of the house and started driving down the road. But I felt this really strong urge or, or desire to photograph that night. But I was also really conflicted. It felt kind of exploitative and weird to do that and want to take pictures when someone was dying. Um, so I pulled over to the side of the road and cried for a few minutes and turned around and went home and grabbed my camera. Uh, and I met my mom and my aunt in the parking lot and told them about, you know, what I was thinking and what was happening. And they, they kind of insisted that I photographed. They understood that it was a way that I connected with the world. Um, and there was a, a tradition in my family that I didn't really know about of people photographing at funerals and having those images after the loved ones had passed on. So there's this series of images where I'm, I'm dealing with the spiritual approach, uh, this scientific approach, and these specimens uh, that I was photographing started to become really abstracted and almost looked like deep space photographs or photographs of nebula and things like that. And I really loved that connection where even the biological specimens were starting to take on a more spiritual or, or heavenly aspect. Um, and one of the things that I love about photography is that ability to to transform the mundane into something that feels a little bit more sacred. These birds that I photograph to me feel really, you know, it makes me think of, uh, you know, Jesus turning into a dove and ascending to heaven and that kind of thing. But really, they were seagulls outside of a museum that I was feeding nuts to while I waited for the other students to finish in, inside. Um, so I love that that contextually I can change things around and it's kind of like a magic trick with photography sometimes. And there was a real sense of sadness in the room that night, but there was also this feeling of communion between me and my family and sharing stories about my grandfather as he passed. And I don't know if he heard that, you know, I don't know what happened. The, the kind of sentimental side of me wants to hope that he did and that he went to heaven. And then biologically, I don't know what happens when human beings die. I don't know if heaven is real. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if what happens is that we go back into the ground and we turn into food for something else. Uh, and that's where I kind of bounce back to these biological images. So it's this kind of tumbling through these questions that you'll see happening all throughout um, all throughout these different bodies of work where I'm, I'm searching and thinking about a question that I don't ever really answer, and I don't think that's the point that I'm looking for. 
And towards the end of the night, there was this feeling of release. Uh, you know, he had been asleep the whole time. This next photograph is sometimes hard to look at. It's a photograph uh, where I focus right on this vein in his neck that I just watched the whole night. Um, he died of congestive heart failure in the end of it. Um, and I watched this vein the whole night in his neck pulsing. Uh, and I think about that kind of like marking and metering out the last moments of his life. But at the end of it, there was a feeling of, of release for the whole room, that it was finally, it was done. He had peace and rest, and it was finished. And that's where that name comes from, quietus, of laying down burdens at the end of a journey or a rest at the end of something. And so I was, I was finishing up graduate school, um, or sorry, undergraduate school. This is still undergraduate school. I got married really young, and that was a mistake. Nothing bad happened, but uh, we were really young, and because of my kind of hyper-religious upbringing, there was never a question of would I marry this, this girl that was my girlfriend, but when would we get married? When would we get married and settle down and have kids and that kind of thing? And so we got married really early. Uh, and then we realized, or I realized, maybe she realized too, but I, I brought it up uh, that, you know, we're kind of friends. I guess we're friends, but it doesn't really feel like um, this, was, this was where we should have ended up. And she agreed. And so I was, I was going through this divorce. I had just lost my grandfather, who was a, a huge deal in my life. And I also realized that I was going to be going to graduate school. I was accepted to Arizona State University. I was going to be moving clear across the country. Um, and I thought about what would I miss? What did I love? And it was my friends. I had built this community uh, and I was going to be moving away from everyone I had ever known. And so I started thinking about kind of the stages of grief and uh, the way that we react to people uh, dying, you know, death and dying and the stages of grief. And I wanted to photograph uh, my friends before I left, but I realized that they, they weren't experiencing these same feelings, that really what I was doing was creating self-portraits by photographing these other people. Um, and so... I, uh, you know, I talked to them about what I wanted to do and they, they sort of stood in as actors and I photographed them um, in, this, in this kind of aesthetic way that made me think of Victorian portraits, not necessarily the, the mortality images of folks who had already died, but, uh, you know, people didn't smile in old pictures for a lot of reasons. There was a higher mortality rate, there was cholera, uh, they had bad teeth, but also uh, I think the real reason is that they wanted their photographs to appear like paintings. They wanted there to be this removed austerity in them. And so I tried to photograph my friends like that, but I really wanted to use the wet plate collodion process. And we'll get into that a lot later um, in, in kind of in depth and in, in what that process looks like. But basically it involves a lot of chemicals on different substrates. And I really wanted that to work for me, but it didn't. Uh, all I kind of ended up with was a finger that looked like this and a bunch of garbage images on plates that I ended up throwing away. Um, but I, I photographed these images using pieces of photo paper in the camera, in an 8x10 camera. Uh, and that gave me this aesthetic that I was looking for, this kind of dreamier uh, aesthetic. In the 1800s, they called it effect. They wanted photographs to have effect and, and seem not so realistic uh, and a little bit more removed from reality. Um, and I wanted to create sort of a shrine. So... You know, my grandfather, one of the things that he talked about a lot was was material authenticity. He didn't call it that, but he was a sign painter, like I mentioned, and he hated vinyl signs. He hated the idea that someone could put a design into a computer and have it spit out, uh, and they didn't really have to do any work with that. It just kind of made their design for them. And so I worked back and forth, you know, when I was in undergraduate school, I learned about working in the darkroom and making these kinds of images. Uh, by hand and then I also learned this digital technology and I wanted to play with that idea and bring all those things together so I photographed these images in a big old camera that you stick your head under the dark cloth uh, I printed them in the dark room, but then I scanned them and made these larger prints, and then I created these shadow boxes, and they were put on there with resin. And then I built inside the gallery, I built this room uh, that was much darker than this. Uh, it really looked like this. Um, but I covered the floor with grass, and I hung these images on the wall to make this sort of shrine to that which I was losing. The grass on the floor was meant to create a, an entirely separate 
piece, uh, an entirely separate feeling from a gallery. I didn't want it to feel like a sterile environment where you walked in and, and just were not part of what you were seeing. So I had folks take off their shoes. They went into this dark room with the grass. It smelled different. It was hot. Uh, there were bugs <laughs> that lived in the grass that I did not think of uh, that kind of lived in the installation while it was up at, at school. Um, and it was really a, a kind of a separate place and it did exactly what I wanted for the first time and it made me realize that one of the things I loved as an artist is creating an experience where where regardless of whether it's just a photograph on the wall I wanted folks to look at my work not only for what it was but for what else it could do I wanted it to be a kind of a catalyst or a, the beginning of a conversation and not only a statement or the end of a conversation and then I moved to Arizona, which is one of my least favorite places in the world. It's very hot. Phoenix, I feel like, is ugly. Uh, it's not a beautiful place. The desert is beautiful when you get out of Phoenix, but Phoenix itself, uh, and as a poor student, I didn't get a lot of opportunity to travel. Um, but, you know, that kind, of, that kind of dislike of geography can be... Uh, inspirational in that you don't have anything else pulling your attention away you kind of focus on what you're working on um, but the first the first month or six months I don't even know anymore of graduate school were pretty rough uh, I walked around and kind of photographed anything and everything that I saw just making you know I saw this thing on the side of the road thought it was weird stopped took a picture um, went to Sedona and thinking about uh, vortexes, vortices, I don't know if you pluralize it that way, if you're talking about the spiritual vortex, um, but, you know, thinking about how this, this monolithic stone lines up with that spiral in the clouds. Um, they, they, images were fine, but it didn't mean anything at all to me. I was just kind of practicing my craft and sketching almost with a camera and thinking about how I could photograph in this new place removed from all the friends and family that I'd left behind me. And then I made this image that I didn't even know this person. She was visiting uh, one of my friends in graduate school and we all went to the Grand Canyon. And I made this photograph using a kind of a weird lens that allows you to play with, with focus. Um, and I loved the way that looking at this photograph made me think about how it felt to try to remember someone where not all the details were clearly in focus where weird things kind of stuck out and I started thinking a lot about memory and how our memory functions and about you know not only um, experientially but from a neuroscientific kind of point of view and how neurons work and pathways within our brain and thinking about how to access that so part of my experimentation was I coated some of these images in wax and put different scents in the wax to try to trigger different memories for folks. And it didn't matter to me what the memories might be. Uh, it more mattered to me that I would be able to get that to happen, that I would be able to get some kind of memory to come out. This uh, photograph, the left and right rectangles on the screen are the same image, if that makes sense. This is one object photographed twice on the left is how you would see the object as you approached it and the viewer was provided with a little spray bottle like an old perfume bottle with alcohol in it uh, rubbing alcohol and if you spritzed the photograph you could see it for just a split second or two before the alcohol evaporated and i was trying to think about how how sometimes you can't quite remember something it's kind of on the tip of your tongue or on the tip of your brain and so i thought a lot about memory and, and read a lot about it and it was also around this time that I started trying to play with the wet plate collodion process again. Uh, and so just a quick rundown of this process, because we're going to come back to it a couple of times. It was invented in the 1850s, and it, it kind of came along towards the beginning of photography. You had daguerreotypes, which were images on a highly polished silver plate or a, a copper plate that was coated in silver. Um, they were beautiful, uh, but they weren't reproducible. Um, so you ended up with this kind of one-of-a-kind object. The wet plate collodion process came around about, about 10 years later, a little bit more, maybe closer to 15. Uh, and it did a few things that daguerreotypes couldn't. It allowed you to make a photograph that was reproducible. If you photographed on glass, uh, you could make a negative. If you photographed on metal, you could make what was called a tintype. Uh, and that was a really cheap way to make an image. And lots of folks were able to have their photographs made that never had been able to before. Um, and then you could also photograph on dark glass and make what was called an ambrotype. So the wet plate collodion process had these kind of three branches that you could use. 
Um, so I went to graduate school in Arizona, funnily enough, because there was a man there uh, who studied lots of different old processes in photography. And I thought, well, surely he knows how to do this process and he'll be able to teach me. So I got there and I said, Jim, I'm ready for you to teach me wet plate collodion. And he said, Josh, I do not know how to do that. But here's a four page handout that I got one time in a workshop. So good luck. Um, so I used that handout and figured out how to do it uh, with some with some experimentation. So uh, I had started dating a woman who is now my wife, Elizabeth, uh, but she very, very kindly agreed to put on this dress that I bought at the Goodwill and let me make some pictures of her. And I was excited because I was getting something to happen. I was getting something to show up on these pieces of glass that I was photographing with. But the more and more that I looked at them, the more it felt kind of empty. Uh, you know, it was, it was a series of photographs where I got the technique to start working, but I wasn't saying anything. It was just kind of an exercise in making the photographs work. Um, but it, it made me start thinking. And I, I started working on my, my graduate thesis work and really focusing in on what it was about memory that I loved. And this photograph, I say often in talks that this is the best photograph I've ever made and then I wait for people to laugh uh, because it doesn't look like a very good photograph it's kind of all messed up and it's blurry and there's a big mark through the face um, but thinking about how our memory works you don't remember what you think you remember if that makes sense uh, the poet Borges talked about it like a penny laid on the table you lay a penny on the table and that that first contact is the memory and then every time you revisit that memory, you lay another penny on the stack and you get further and further away from the original idea. Um, contemporary neuroscience bears that out, but even more kind of devastatingly in that the more you remember something, the more you damage your ability to get back to that original memory. So you kind of remember these pathways that branch off. Um, but when I looked at this photograph, it made me think about, again, what it felt like to try to remember my wife's face or what it looked like when she walked past me or the smell that she might leave behind of her perfume. Francis Bacon talked about wanting his paintings to look like a snail had passed between them and left a trail of their slime, like, uh, or sorry, a human had passed between them and left a trail of their existence like a snail might leave its slime. And my wife is not slimy, nor is she a snail, uh, but, it, you know, that idea that this was something of her essence, not what she looked like, but what it felt like to to try to remember her when she wasn't there. And this photograph too kind of relates to that idea of trying to piece together a memory. So this was a photograph that I hand cut uh, with a, an X-Acto knife and then I scanned it in and had it laser cut out of a 24 by 36 inch photograph. And I hung this in the gallery and a really interesting thing happened. If you were across the gallery, uh, or if you, especially if you were across the gallery and you held up a cell phone to take a picture of this, you could very clearly see the image. And if, if you all will kind of squint at your screen, you can kind of see the image on the left pretty clearly. It's definitely a face. But the closer you got to it, the more that image fell apart. And I was interested in that gestalt uh, effect, how, how the image was created in your mind. But the closer you got to it, the more you tried to examine it, the less you could really access what was happening. Also just really interested in uh, forcing people to interact with the photographs in a more intimate way. So, you know, there are statistics that say that when folks go to a museum or a gallery, they interact with a piece of art for seconds, five or six seconds, something like that. And I wanted to create a situation where you had to really put in some effort to engage with the photograph. So I made this kind of camera box, but instead of looking through a viewfinder, you had to look through the lens. And inside was one of those earlier ambrotypes. And you could never really quite make out the whole image at the same time. You had to kind of peer around and you would just get little pieces of it. I also wanted to try to inject even some false optimism perhaps, uh, but I was reading Ray Bradbury's Dandelion Wine and thinking about like a happiness machine and there's also some mythology especially uh, in Norse mythology that if you lose someone their spirit goes into an object and if you can find that object you might be able to get their essence back out of it. So this was called a device for the distillation of memory that you could put these objects inside of it and hopefully get somebody's memories back out of it. It was also around this time uh, that I realized that memory wasn't just something that I had stumbled upon and why, why I might be interested in it. Um, 
my father uh, lost his short-term memory when I was about 13 years old. He lost the ability to make short-term memories with carbon monoxide poisoning. And, I, you know, I'm not the smartest man in the world. And I feel like that should have dawned on me much earlier than it did. But it took me a long time to realize that that might have a very significant part uh, to play in why I was interested in memory. So I wanted to see what I could do to relate this to that, that specific subject. My father, his loss of memory and how that kind of affected my life after that. And I wanted a viewer to take part in that. So I covered this photograph uh, with masking tape. And the idea was that the viewer would be invited to peel the tape off to see the image underneath, but in doing so would damage the photograph uh, when they got to the lower layers. My graduate faculty convinced me that nobody would ever do that, so I did it myself. And that's really one of my only regrets from graduate school is that I didn't just tell them to hush and, and make the viewer do that, uh, but I did it myself. So I hung both of those in the gallery. Um, but I, I really wanted to create that sort of interactive spirit. And working with the idea of my father, too, and, and thinking about memories vanishing, I wanted to think about how could I put his memories back into something? How could I get those memories out of an object and put them back into uh, something that would live on and that I could have a relationship with in a different way? So these are photographs that were burned, not as an act of catharsis or out of any kind of negative feeling, but to act as fertilizer for this tree. So I, I burned some photographs and put them in the soil of this acacia tree. Uh, and acacia tree is associated with the tree of life and immortality. Um, and I was thinking, what if I could grow these memories back into a tree and that that tree could provide oxygen and that somehow would become infused with my blood and that I would be able to have this kind of internal relationship with these memories that I couldn't have in any physical way. And I also wanted to be a little bit antagonistic. So during one meeting with a professor, I brought in a box that had a photograph inside it. And I said, I want people to treat this like it's a meditation almost, like, it, like it's going to take them time to look at it. It was just a little handheld box. Uh, and he said, I'm not going to mess with that. What do I care? I'm not going to take these four bolts out of this box to look at a picture. So I said, okay. Uh, and then I made a box that had uh, these 14 bolts in it, and you had to kneel on it like a prayer kneeler and take out each of the bolts to see the photograph that was held inside. And the trick was that that cyanotype was printed on translucent paper, and when you picked it up to look at it, you couldn't see it anymore. It had to have the dark background. As soon as you picked it up, the image kind of vanished. And so again, playing with that notion that you could never get back to the original memories that you had lost. A uh, few more methods of, of making photographs. This is called a gum bichromate print. Uh, and usually folks will use pigments with this to make the image really legible and, and kind of vibrant and beautiful, but I only use the gum itself. Uh, and you can also kind of work with the surface. So I removed this person's face and just kind of left the background there. So thinking about the memory of an event, but not being able to place the person that was there. This was another photograph. Uh, and this is my wife, Elizabeth. And I love the way that she kind of merged with the landscape of Arizona, which is where I met her and thinking about how uh, memory and, and time can kind of collapse in on itself and make this one kind of jumbled mess sometimes rather than distinct flashes. Also wanted to play with the idea of uh, people say that well, people, I think, often mistakenly say that like Native American cultures and, and some different cultures like that believe that photography steals your soul. I don't know that any cultures believe that, uh, you know, verbatim, uh, but the French poet Honoré de Balzac did think that each human was kind of a stack of membranes that existed in space. Uh, and that whenever your your image was made, that one of those films was kind of peeled off that stack. So this was a box that you could look into the front and turn that crank underneath and kind of see these little films that had been removed from this person's existence. I also wanted to see how photographs, uh, how how sculpture could photograph in the same way that a sorry, how sculpture could function in the same way that a photograph does and act as a, a kind of a placeholder or a memory. So this piece is called She's Been Gone These Five Long Years, uh, and it's a lock of hair that's been protected under these bell jars 
for each year that the person is gone. Uh, and that relates to a very specific scientific idea that the some of you may know that the kilogram, I don't know that it still is, but it used to be represented by this little cylinder that was kept in a vault in France, uh, and it was kept under two bell jars. It was kind of pressure controlled, and that, that standard mass was how everything from the weight uh, for the value of gold uh, to shipping rates, all the stuff was calculated based on the weight of that one scientific constant. Uh, and there were little copies of it all over the world called witnesses, and they bring them together every once in a while to measure them, and they're always different. Uh, the the constant, you know, the Legrand K, that's what it was called, that was kept in the vault, stayed the same, and the other, or sorry, that one changed, uh, and the other one stayed the same, and they, they couldn't figure out why. And I loved thinking about how that kind of scientific idea, how the world is built almost, uh, changed and and thinking about how how silly it is to think that our memories could be saved. Um, this is another piece that I was working with sculpturally. This one and the next one, where I used to spend a lot of time in this one specific bend of the Ohio River and thinking about how. Um, taking the water from there is like taking a photograph out of context uh, and having this box of water that I kept as a memory um, was the same for me as having an image made there. And then these next couple of slides are another attempt at making a portrait of a person without making a picture. So this is a, a portrait of my wife Elizabeth that has bourbon from our uh, engagement party, some of her hair, some ashes from our fireplace, and a bee that I killed for her. And this is, a, this is a family album, so each of those is a rack of these kind of vials that contained uh, information about a family member, a friend, a loved one, something like that. And so that's, a, that's, you know, kind of the weirdest, that's the setup for all this weird stuff that's about to come. But this is, this is where I came from photographically. I, I had all these ideas about how photographs function and memory and trying to place myself in that continuum of saving memories, but also recognizing their deterioration and loss uh, and how that can be beautiful and sad and, and work all together at once. So after graduate school, I got married about a month before my thesis show, uh, which was a mistake because that was way too much stuff going on at once, but it all worked out great. We're, we just celebrated 10 years, so that's good. Um, but right after I graduated, we wanted to get out of Phoenix, and uh, my wife's family lived in She's from Arizona, but her family had moved to Pennsylvania uh, prior to that. And so we moved out there uh, to live near them. And in doing so, I kind of lost my community again. Um, I, I lost uh, the, the folks that I had met in Arizona and, and made relationships with. I lost my access to facilities at Arizona State University uh, and couldn't really figure out what I was doing. And so I started the same way that I started when I moved to Arizona, photographing what was around me. And one day the dog had to go to the bathroom. I took him out in the backyard and I saw this little maple seed uh, laying on our trash can. And I photographed it and turned it black and white. And, you know, I thought it was interesting, but I wanted to do something else with it. And I was trying to think, how can I make a community for myself? How can I share my artwork with people and have conversation about it without being physically present with them? And Instagram was just sort of starting to become a thing at that point. And so I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this on Instagram. I'm going to start an account just for this work. And I'm going to share this and see what happens. And uh, I, I really fell in love with it. I, I fell in love with it and started going around everywhere in our yard, in our neighborhood, at our mother's house, um, anywhere that I was. I started looking around on the ground around me. Um, these robin's eggs, they were in a nest in a tree in our yard. And every time I mowed the yard, I would look over and see them. And eventually I got a little closer and realized that they had been something had gotten to them and, and kind of eaten the inside of the egg. So these were just this preserved little beautiful vignette in this nest. But I just started thinking about how much I didn't pay attention to. Uh, there's a book called The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram. Uh, and it talks about how, you know, think about the last time that you actually heard birds chirp. That might be a bad test because a lot of us probably noticed that today if you walked outside. Um, but how many things we don't pay attention to because we trade, uh, you know, convenience and speed for a deeper relationship with our surroundings. Um, and so I started thinking about these these creatures around me in the world uh, and my my responsibility to them and my place uh, ecologically in in the systems all around me uh, and really went crazy photographing all this stuff. 
And then I remember after doing this for actually a year or two, or maybe even three, standing in my backyard and thinking, this is a stupid thing for a grown up to do. Uh, taking my cell phone, uh, that's what I was photographing this, these with, my cell phone, and, and kind of walking around photographing bugs and plants and stuff that I found in the yard. Um, but for some reason, I think, you know, it's important that artists are able to, to continue doing work even when it gets hard. And that, that thought just helped me keep kind of pressing on. Uh, and so I kept photographing. Uh, I love cicadas. People always ask me what my favorite subject is with this work, and it's, it's cicadas. Uh, because I love the cycles that they go through. Uh, I love this idea that they're kind of buried in the earth for 17 years and they come back out with the sole purpose of making more cicadas and then dying. And then that's uh, just this really interesting cycle that they go through. But I also just love aesthetically, I love the shape of their wings and, and how that works. Um, but I, I kept going through and photographing these and learning things around me. This is Jimson weed, uh, which is very beautiful, but it's also very poisonous. It's a hallucinogenic. Um, and, and thinking about how I could discover all of these different things around me. And I started to wonder, like, okay, well, how does this have anything to do with the other work that I make? You know, folks talk about artists having a... Uh, a signature or a style or this is this is what I make you know Picasso made his Picassos and uh, so on Jackson Pollock you can tell a Jackson Pollock painting but I I realized that I wasn't interested in that I wasn't interested in making a brand for myself or making a singular kind of image uh, even though this specific series has a very distinct aesthetic I wasn't necessarily uh, concerned with how this fit into my overall body of work you know for my whole life but then I realized that while I was photographing this, one of the things I thought about over and over was how my mom, one of her favorite stories to tell about me was that when I was little, I used to lay in the yard and uh, count ants as they would crawl around or catch June bugs on the rose bushes. And how I used to have this innate curiosity and relationship to nature that I lost as I grew up, that, you know, we trade, we trade that stuff off uh, as responsibilities grow, as we have jobs, as we have other things to do. Um, and I, I was thinking about how this really was a catalyst for me to think about my childhood and that, that curiosity that I had lost. Um, this is my wife Elizabeth's favorite photograph, so I always make sure to include this one. But this was, uh, this is Marilyn, you may be familiar with this tree that was right at the end of the Schaefer Center. There's this Japanese maple, and I would walk past it every day that I went into school. And just thinking about how the leaves changed, the seeds changed over the seasons, there was this whole kind of play that was happening in front of me and capturing this beautiful little dance-like um, leaf that was on there. Or this acorn, you know, I, we have 15 oak trees in our yard and the acorns sometimes sound like a rainstorm when the wind blows. Uh, and I found one of these kind of sprouting out of the ground and it was really striking to me how it resembled lungs, uh, how it resembled kind of your, your breathing system. Um, but it was this thing that would turn into an oak tree and eventually exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. And just finding these little alien plants. This was growing near a parking garage, and it was just this little thing called a button bush flower. And I'd never seen that in my whole life. Uh, and we parked one day, and I got out and saw that and was just kind of arrested by its beautiful form. Or this snake that was run over at the gas station. <laughs> the, the, the attendant who looked at me like a total weirdo when I asked if she cared if I took it. I think she was very glad that I took it, but also very glad when I left. Because <laughs> who asks for a snake? Um, and there's there's another one of my little buddies, a cicada. Uh, people hate them, but I think they're so fascinating. So this work uh, is kind of what led to to a lot of uh, opportunities in my life. I, I told you I kept photographing this even though I thought it was maybe a stupid thing to do. I was sharing it on Instagram, which I was receiving some, some flack from colleagues and other folks I had gone to graduate school with for using a cell phone and kind of uh, using this dumb medium that people use to photograph their food or take selfies. Uh, but because of Instagram, my work was seen by a, a f an editor at National Geographic, and they contacted me, and at first I thought it was a joke. The person contacted me and said, hey, can you send us all the pictures from this series? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> uh, and then I, I called and left a voicemail, and they, they said that they were from National Geographic, and I said, oh, never mind. Yeah, let's talk about it. Um, so they, they published a story about my work in National Geographic, and it was published all over the world, uh, and it was about this this idea of searching for wonder all around you and these images that captured the the life and the ecology that that were all around me in this in this distinct place 
and I like to include this one. This is a little salamander. A lot of times folks will ask me if I kill the stuff that I photograph. I will kill a bug. I will kill a fly or a moth or something like that. I will not kill an animal. And that's probably a stupid distinction and just a weird personal line. Uh, but so this salamander was just on my light table kind of flopping all around. <laughs> uh, and it made this infinity sign. And I couldn't, I couldn't resist sharing that. I loved it so much when it did that as a little gift. So, you know, that, that kind of opened up a new branch in my artistic practice of thinking not only about memory and how my work connected to that, but thinking about place and personal wayfinding and how I fit into the world. One of the things I love in photography are these simple processes that produce really beautiful results. And one of those processes is called lumen printing. And basically what you do is take a piece of black and white photo paper and lay something on it in the sunlight and it creates these really kind of vibrant beautiful colors because of a process called amalgamation where the sunlight changes the silver molecules uh, and they refract light differently and they they turn these different colors so black and white photo paper can can produce these really amazing colorful results but i started to think with these about how could i make images that related to the place that they were taken um, and so many of these photographs are made uh, you know, if I find a plant growing, I will, I will put that plant, or this is a cicada wing again, I'll put that wing in the place that I found the insect and use the same kind of sunlight that, that shines down on that place uh, to make the photograph. Uh, this one I thought was really interesting because you can see uh, in one of the bends of that, that little root there, there's kind of some mold that sprouted, and this paper was from the 1930s, uh, and I made the photograph on it and put it in water, and the mold grew out of the paper. So I thought that was just another interesting little link to the physical and to the place that the paper itself had a, a kind of a biome on it. Um, and these are some similar images. This is a little bit different process called uh, chromatype, um, and I won't if anybody's interested we can talk about that later but just an interesting kind of re related process that that produces a positive image um, by placing these plant materials on there so this is just a short kind of diversion into another uh, place-based series of photography because that that kind of started becoming more and more present in my mind the idea that not only exploring my interior landscape but starting to think about where i found myself and I, you know, during all this process, I had accepted the job at Appalachian State. I've been here about seven years now uh, and moved down here uh, with my family. And when I moved down here, <laughs> someone said to me, the New River is the oldest river in the world. And I thought, what? That is amazing. How can that be true? And it turns out that that is not true. The New River is not the oldest river in the world. But as I'm sure a lot of you know, it is one of the really old rivers of the world. It's one of the oldest rivers in the world. Uh, and I love the idea that um, that I lived where it started. I don't think I'd never thought about a river starting before. It just always was. I, I had that piece where I grew up on the Ohio River. Uh, and thinking about that. And then I was amazed to find out that the New River is is a long, you know, a far back the list, but it's a tributary of the Ohio River. Uh, and so the water that started up on this mountain, up on Snake Mountain, um, flowed past my house where I grew up eventually. Uh, I thought that was a really beautiful kind of connection between those two places. Um, but thinking about that river being so old got me thinking about the Garden of Eden and creation and uh, going back to my roots and religion and, and thinking about place and identity and how all that was tied together. I wanted to go where the, the new river started and people kept telling me it was a steep and I didn't know what a steep meant and it was exactly what it sounded like. You walk along and there it is, just a puddle that starts in the ground and then it turns into a stream. Uh, and, it, you know, there's this little uh, pond at the top of the ridge up on Snake Mountain uh, and then it kind of flows down and, and starts one of the uh, branches of the new river um, but thinking about this this idea of origin and the garden of eden and this water starting here and having flowed past my house how the appalachian mountains used to be part of the central pangean mountains that were part of the atlas mountains in western africa and the scottish highlands and how all that came together and thinking about religion in the south and and all of those kinds of ideas um, made me start to consider this this portrait of a river almost thinking about how to photograph the people uh, around the river how a river influences economies and communities um, and the ecology of that place 
uh, and trying to think about how to make a portrait. And this is a project that I still work on today. Uh, that's a thing that, that I, you're probably noticing that I worked on projects for a long time. Uh, I started that photographic survey project in 2012 and I've made the last pictures that I've made of it a couple weeks ago. Um, and so exploring the ideas of place and origin and, and how I fit in. I love that, uh, you know, thinking about fishing, but then just up the hill from that was a do not drink the water boiling notice for this campground that was just using the same water that was coming out of the river. And thinking about how places change. So this is early photography from uh, when they were just starting to work on the expanded road between uh, Watauga and Ash County 221, um, which they completed recently and it's great to drive on. Um, but thinking about people's uh, feelings about that and the idea of the lost provinces and how this area was separated from so many places uh, and even the fear of change, folks being afraid in Ash County that this would really change the way it is and it could, I mean that remains to be seen, uh, but change is kind of inevitable and thinking about how that plays into our lives. This was a wall of a hydroelectric dam and freeze. Um, and I love how the, the minerals have dripped down over that wall for so many years and it almost looks like stalactites or a glacier. And thinking about, you know, again, the economy of this place with Christmas trees and, and how that uh, affects everything around it and, you know, the runoff from the Christmas trees going into that little stream and how that could be a pollutant um, and thinking about the trade-offs that we make in the places that we live. And sometimes just beauty, you know, I was on the way to a conference and I saw this this rainbow shining over the pot of gold school bus uh, and couldn't help stopping and making that picture or this little... Uh, this little used car hut on the side of 221 that, I, that and I don't know what these red and green lights were, but I just passed them all the time and loved the way that looked. So stopped and made a few pictures of that um, building and just thinking about that little place that's been there for so long uh, and the sign on it, you can't really see it, but it says like, this is not uh, the property of the highway department. Like, please leave this place alone, basically. Um, and just thinking about that, that perseverance or, or, you know, kind of personal property. And I, I still feel like I've barely scratched the, the surface of this project. I, I love learning about the land and trying to be conscious of beauty and the fragility of the river system. Um, and thinking about, again, that this river started here uh, and flowed past my boyhood home. Uh, and now I live here and how that, that kind of all links up uh, and thinking about place and memory. I'm going to show you just a few more uh, bodies of work here that are related to some of these ideas. I like to go, you know, I like to move in and out. I like to move between the the macro and the micro and thinking about the broad picture. So I think about my personal place and exactly where I live uh, and the ecology of that place. But I also think about the systems that we build as human beings. So I don't know if you know the poem Ozymandias, but you're about to hear it because I'm going to read it to you while I go through these pictures. Um, but I think about how I think about hubris. I think about the things we build and how we think they'll last uh, and how we also watch them crumble, just like our memories crumble, just like our houses crumble, um, relationships and all that kind of thing. So I'm going to read this poem to you while I flip through a few of these images. It says, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear my name is ozymandias king of kings look on my work ye mighty and despair nothing beside remains Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And so those are images that I make just, you know, in my day-to-day -day life. I often make them with my cell phone, and they are, they are uh, parking garages and beaches and uh, the sidewalk and gravestones and places that I find these really beautiful textures, but that I think about as meditations on, on decay, on how the things that we build uh, slowly fade. Um, and kind of pulling out even further than that, thinking about how we function in the universe. Um, so this body of work called There Are Other Worlds Than These, 
I'm going to preface by saying I love science. I love exploration. I love space. I wanted to be an astronaut as a little kid, just like everybody else does. But I also worry that we sometimes think of uh, space exploration like manifest destiny and like looking for resources from other places and like a, an escape plan for what happens when Earth becomes inhabitable rather than thinking about what we can do to fix this place. And so rather than, than making a judgment about thinking, I don't think space travel is bad, I think it's great, I love watching spaceships lift off and things like that, but questioning the impulse to search for other worlds while we destroy our own. Uh, these images are meant to be meditations on those ideas. And uh, if anybody has questions at the end about what they're actually pictures of, I'm happy to talk about that. But the photographer Minor White said, don't photograph things for what they are, photograph them for what else they are. And so when people ask me what these are pictures of, I say that they are pictures of planets because that is what they are pictures of, or rather that's what else they are pictures of. And they're my meditation on, uh, many of you are probably familiar with Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot. Uh, if I'm in the mood to have a really good cry, I will uh, pull up Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, and I tend to share it in my photo classes for folks to think about their place in the universe a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I do this with a lot of my bodies of work. The thing that I'm photographing isn't necessarily meant to be the thing that one would focus on. It's meant to be... Uh, kind of an idea that that acts as the beginning of a conversation. Um, and so there are at present, or I think I think this series is probably done. Sometimes I like to just finish a series and call it done instead of just keeping working on the same thing forever, uh, because then I have 30 series of work that I'm working on. Um, but right now there are 55 images in that series. Um, and that is that is the current number of exoplanets that have been discovered that could possibly support life. They're in that Goldilocks zone um, of where, uh, of habitability around whatever star they, they kind of go around. So there are 55 planets that I've created that, that represent those 55 uh, Earth possibilities. And then we're going to finish up here with a series called Breaking Ground. So kind of bringing everything back together, thinking about my place, ecology, how people interact with the Earth, uh, and the wet plate collodion process. One of the reasons that I love that process so much, and I've talked about it several times today, is that I think there's a real poetry, uh, poetry of place that, that happens with that process, where I take my dark room on site with me, where I'm going to be photographing. I set it up, and on site, I pour the plate. I basically make film. While it's still wet, I put it in the camera, and I make an image. And the light that strikes the, the subject of my photograph is the same light that creates the image on the plate. Uh, so there's this physical connection between the object that I end up with, this tin type, this photograph on metal or glass, uh, and the person who was there. This thing was on site, and it, it kind of makes an artifact of that real physical interaction. And I think there's a real, uh, a different kind of aura or weight that happens because of that. And so... I intend for this project to be pretty broad and focus on kind of creators and, and creative folks in the high country and maybe beyond at some point. Um, originally, I thought this series was about Appalachia, but I've since learned that, you know, Appalachia is not monolithic, just like any cultural region or, or group of people. And so I've stopped couching it in those terms. Certainly there are elements of Appalachia in here, um, but this is not a series of work about Appalachia. What I'm going to show you right now, these, this series of work is, is largely about Against the Grain Farm in Zionville. Uh, I meant to spend a weekend photographing there and actually spent a year photographing there so far. Uh, and intend to keep going back, but making images of, of the folks that work and live there and really thinking about how they, they work with the earth, um, how they think about uh, biofuels and, and uh, biochar and um, composting and how the things that they grow on the farm, the animals that they raise kind of feed back into the same ecosystem and how this wet plate collodion process uses the same light to create these photographs that they use to grow the plants. Um, you know, this was a couple of interns that lived and worked there. This was their goat patches uh, or stitches. I think it was stitches, but maybe patches. Sorry, goat 
I forgot your name, uh, but they they composted this goat and I got there and I asked if I could make some photographs of it. But I think that's really lovely and, and goes back to those ideas that I talked about at the very beginning of mortality and cycles and what happens when things die. Um, but also just thinking about growing and interacting with our own food systems uh, in a place and, and being part of your own life in a really deep kind of way. Uh, and trying to capture all the different aspects of that using this really historical place-based process. Um, this is, I love this picture of Thomas. I told him, I think he thought I was weird. I mean, a lot of people think I'm weird. Y'all probably do too, because you've listened to me talk for an hour now about being weird. Uh, but Thomas seemed to have a special kinship with this tractor. So I wanted to make a picture of him kind of patting it on the nose like you would a beloved pet or something like that. Um, this was a, a 10 minute exposure of some garlic that was hanging up in the barn. And this process is super uh, not sensitive to light. If you have, if you used film uh, and you remember ISOs and ASAs, uh, the speed of wet plate collodion is approximately ISO 0.75. <laughs> uh, so not very fast at all. Um, so I, this was a 10 minute exposure to get some pictures of their garlic. I really wanted to make a picture of, um, of her feeding uh, her daughter. Um, that was something that I saw on the farm a lot. Uh, and she's such a strong woman. Uh, and I loved that she would just be working and breastfeeding Corva while she worked. Uh, Holly and Andy run the farm and Holly is really sort of the spirit uh, of everything. And I loved how strong she is just kind of, you know, walking out in the field, start the tractor, breastfeed Corva, keep on moving. Uh, and I loved making this picture and, and kind of capturing that spirit that she that she represents on the farm. Um, you know, this is a kind of a simple photograph of their uh, lettuce. They they do a CSA. Some of you might be a member of that, and they sell stuff at the farmers market. So this is in what they call the pack shed uh, when they're getting the stuff ready to send out to market. And they raise these turkeys every year. Uh, the turkeys poop on the farm. They use that for fertilizer. They use the turkeys, uh, parts of the turkeys when they process them for uh, Thanksgiving. They use those to go back into the compost and kind of work with the, the plants um, that they grow. Uh, and again, just thinking about those cycles and things being, being kind of circular in that system that they have. B on the farm, their other daughter has this uh, uh, her own little flower garden. So I wanted to capture her. Um, in that space. And then they also do a really traditional sorghum boil uh, every year. So they uh, grow sorghum on the farm. This is Brittany after cutting some sorghum with her machete. Uh, and then they, they top it all off. They cut the tops off so that they get the stalks. Um, they run that through the mill, uh, which kind of presses out all the juice from the sorghum. And then that's rendered down for eight or so hours. Uh, maybe sometimes longer depending on the moisture content and the sugar content to make sorghum molasses and that's kind of a traditional uh, thing and then these are some of the stalks that are left over after the pressings. Um, and I wanted to finish up with this this picture of uh, the family there on the farm. They actually have since had another baby that I haven't had a chance to photograph yet but just thinking again like tying all of this together and thinking about my place in the world, how, how I interact with my place, how I interact with my memories, uh, my thoughts on mortality, how I think about others interacting with their places and how I interact with them, um, and really just trying to understand how I fit, how we all fit, how it all fits together and our responsibilities within that system is what really kind of drives me forward and making work uh, just a, an innate curiosity and a deep desire to understand where I belong. Uh, and I hope that that uh, has been interesting for you. Uh, you're welcome to contact me through my website. Uh, I have Instagram accounts at a photographic survey and Joshua White Photo. And uh, thank you for your kind attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have a question? I want to know how long you've been working on this last project. The uh, breaking ground, the ten types. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it's been on hiatus for the last year, unfortunately, because I haven't wanted to to get in real close contact or leave the house very much. Um, but before that, I'd been working on it for about two years. Uh, one year spent primarily at, against the grain, um, and one year spent photographing a few other farms. But for the purposes of this talk, I just included the in, against the grain stuff. But yeah, it's been about two years. Um, 
actually, I did photograph at the end of last year a little bit. I photographed at Cecil Gerganis's Cane Boil, um, and I'm uh, I'm starting to contact folks again and hoping that I can do some some distance photographing on a few farms this this spring and summer as well. Do you think you'll go back to the um, this one farm? I kind of almost feel like it may become a project of its own because I love those folks so much and I feel like I have a real strong relationship with them. Uh, and I feel like it, it will create a weird balance in a, in a series if I spend so much time and then have a few other places kind of peppered in. So I almost feel like it's going to become its own entity at some point. I guess I my like question... To... Oh, go ahead. Well, I guess the reason I asked that question is how do you know when you're done? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm a good person to ask that question. Uh, you know, the, so for the photographic survey, the little brown pictures of bugs and stuff, I've always had this kind of silly idea that I want a thousand of them and I'm up to a 960 something. So at this point, I feel like I'm going to go ahead and finish out the thousand. Um, for the planets, I had the, I had a really weird confrontational conversation with somebody at a conference and he asked me how many are there and I said I don't know I think I'm going to make a grid of like 36 or something he's like that's stupid you need to have a reason for the number of the pictures in the series and I said okay uh, so I thought about it and I and then I thought you know maybe that is a good idea so then I was researching the planets and came up with a number to end that project funny tie in is that I saw him give a talk the next year and it was all about this man who obsessively sat in a uh, parking lot and counted trains and he kept these notebooks piles of notebooks of counting these trains and i was like oh that's why the numbers matter so much to you you have like this thing in your head that's very specifically tied to that um but you know how do i know when something's done i i feel like i know when it's done when i feel like I don't have more to say about it. When I feel like I'm repeating myself or making the same kinds of images or it just doesn't feel like the relationship is growing. I mean, part of what I, I, I'm never gonna be an artist who shows in New York and people buy my stuff for millions of dollars. I don't really have interest in that. I, I mean, it's a different kind of art world. I make work because it allows me to connect with people and it allows me to feel understood and communicate things that I don't know how to say. And you know, like I said, I love Adam or I love uh, Holly and the um, the farm and the kids and I love being there and I love working with them and getting to know them better and thinking about the way they interact with the world. And photography is the mechanism that allows me to forge that relationship. So Andy and Holly, you know, I wouldn't know them without photography. And it's kind of the, the linchpin or the centerpiece of our relationship. So I feel like while I may be friends with them forever, I'll be done with that project when I feel like I don't have anything else to show or to say about what they're doing. I wanted to getting... take this opportunity to um, <clears throat> tell the folks who are still on that um, I've begun putting the recorded sessions from High Country Lifelong Learners on a YouTube channel for High Country Lifelong Learners. I'll put this one today too. Um, Josh, we had a presentation a couple of weeks ago by Pat Beaver on the um, New River. Yeah. And so you might wanna go see her presentation. The way you find these is go to YouTube, get yourself on YouTube, and then in YouTube search using quote H-C-L-L-L dash dash in quote and that will bring up that's how i'm identifying every high country lifelong learner uh video okay so i'll put this one on there today too if that's okay with you josh if it's not we can talk about it privately <laughs> that's fine fine with me i was struck by your comment about place-based and um I'm an archaeologist, and I've been um, sort of doing the same thing in archaeology, taking concepts like fertility and um, developing them as place-based concepts. So there are specific um, marked rocks, and there are specific rock shelters, and there are specific mountaintops where people go to solicit and make offerings, native peoples, 
and make offerings. And so they're very much connected. They, they very much connect fertility, meaning continuation of a family line or continuation of a community or, you know, the next baby in my family um, or the next crop of corn mm -hmm. um, to, to specific places and places are infused with power. And the spirits that infuse these places can leave because of neglect or 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 affront, um, and and so there are there are you know all of these things that we think of as sort of emotional or ephemeral or whatever. I think I think one can make the case that there's place based. Um, there are, there that, that that they're tethered. That these ideas are tethered in the landscape yeah i mean you know sally mann has a whole series of photographs where she's photographed civil war battlefields and talking about even that kind of feeling where a place is changed by what happens on it and i think it's really interesting thinking about your, your it's kind of the flip side that there are these spiritual relationships and in in that they exist in the place and that they can leave but also how humans change the place and how that kind of scar or that interaction stays in a different way mm -hmm. yeah i have a question i'm from washington dc i'm maryland's sister um i was wondering if boone gets the um the brood number 10 of cicadas do you have a lot of cicadas they're supposed to come out this year again you know, this is the 17th year, so they'll be crawling out from 2004. And I was wondering, do, are you at all interested in that? I mean, they have such a short life, lifetime, you know, they mate, they die immediately almost. So I thought that would be interesting. I don't know, the ground has to get to 64 degrees before they'll actually come out. Yeah, I'm, I really hope we get them. I have the Cicada app on my phone that tells you when, when people are starting to see them. Uh, and if I'm afforded the opportunity, that will be, that will be another in my long list of series that I want to work on. That would be interesting, yeah. Yeah. I remember them from when I was little, actually. Uh, I grew up in Indiana, like I said, and we, um, I don't, whatever the brood is there, one summer they were everywhere. And I remember there were parodies with snappy cicada pizza. Uh, and I remember throwing them in my cousin's hair and catching them and listening to them scream. Uh, I, man, I love them so much. <laughs> yeah, they were everywhere here 17 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I hope they'll be here. Well, is there going to be, uh, or did I miss it already, a Fiddler's Convention this year at ASU? No, they're doing some online stuff, but they're not going to have anything in person. Even Merle Fest is pushed back till September. I've mm -hmm. seen Josh play uh, banjo several times, two years in a row now at, <laughs> at uh, fiddle competitions. <laughs> Last year, our band won third place. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Now, I just want to thank you so much. I just, um, you're speaking to brings your photographs to such life, you know? Um, and I just, I just love your views and your thought process and all too. I, I found it very interesting. So I really appreciate it. I just want to thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Yeah. Second. All right. Well, we'll see you all maybe uh, for the full moon at 645 on Saturday night. Uh, otherwise, I hope to see um, some of or all of you uh, for the coming month with all these literary events. Good seeing you, Josh. Nice to see you, too. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.